Um, and my question explores the linkage between uh, the Ministry of Finance capabilities and budget reform choices that we've been discussing this morning. Um, and I spent much of my working life in two ministries of finance, uh, one in Uganda with, with Kenneth um, and the other in Liberia. And um, they both had very different levels of uh, capability, um, but they've both followed very similar ref reform paths, quite complex reform paths, MTEFs, uh, if misimplementation, cash planning and decentralization. Um, now, I've, I've tried to list kind of four differences um, that I've, I've noted. And I mean, the first was, was bureaucratic functions. Now, in, in Uganda, you know, meetings happened. There was hierarchies with line management. Um, when I went to Liberia, uh, there was no line management. Meetings happened through text messages or in the, in the stairwell when the power was out and you couldn't take the lift. Um, that was where most of the decisions would happen. Um, the other, I think the other is authority, and, and Kenneth touched on this. Um, you know, the Ministry of Finance was, was very strong in Uganda, and it, it, had a, it, had a, 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 it was a clear arm to, to formulate fiscal policy um, through State House and through the executive. Um, in Liberia, on the other hand, uh, was probably more akin to the USA on Philip's uh, scattergraph. Um, the legislative powers were, 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 were far greater in decision making. Um, in some cases, the presidency would not talk to the Ministry of Finance. So it's had a far different, it had a, a, a very different role. Um, the other was the incentive structure that Kenneth mentioned. Um, like Kenneth himself, who could rise through the ranks from economist to director budget, um, many of my co workers in Liberia were on short term contracts. They weren't civil servants. and. Uh, you know, they had not been paid for months, so they spent much of their time worried about where the next paycheck was coming from. So there's a complete different in incentive structure. Um, <coughs> and, and finally, the sort of the technocratic layer in, 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 in Uganda was very strong. Civil servants would make decisions. Uh, in Liberia, ministers essentially work as technocrats, and, and they do much of the technical work uh, to inform decisions. Now, um, I mean, in these very different circumstances, I think my... My question says, you know, is, there a ca is there a capability benchmark um, before certain PFM reforms are adopt adopted? Because you know, these reforms have had varied success in both uh, Uganda, which have been very successful, and Liberia, where they've been less successful. Um, and if, if so, what's the thinking on sequencing? Uh, or if not, is this a chicken and egg debate? Uh, can, can capability be developed by learning by doing uh, through the reform process? So was, was that how some of these capabilities in Uganda were formed? Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Um, Neil, I think, was the next. Thanks. Um, um, two points. Um, the, the first is that I, I, I believe that, that ministries of finance are as capable as the people that work for it. Um, we had this opportunity to to interview um, um, the former Minister of Finance of South Africa in preparation for, for an, a Cabri annual seminar. And um, what we were trying to get out in the interview was what contributed towards the National Treasury being the successful organization that it, that it was and still is. And, and surprisingly enough, what the Minister did not mention was the powers that the Constitution gave the Ministry of Finance and neither did he speak about the Public Finance Management Act. He spoke about the team um, that he was able to build. He spoke about the support that he received um, from um, President Mandela and later from um, the, the president that, that followed Mandela. Um, and, and, and the kind of, um, with, within an environment that was, that was, that was rather difficult, um, in many respects, he was operating in, in a situation that was probably as good as it was ever going to get. Um, but, but clearly what, what, what came across was that a lot could have, been, could have gone wrong if it was the wrong people that, 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 well, firstly appointed as Minister of Finance and also at a technical management level. Um, a lot certainly went wrong with other ministries at the time in South Africa, and, and I think what, what, what worked in the favor of the National Treasury was that it had the right people 
appointed within a, an environment that was probably going to be as good as it was ever going to get. The, the second point is, and I think this, this ties in with, with a lot that the panel has been saying, is that ministries of finance can also become their own worst enemies. Um, in, in that coordinating role that ministries of finance have, um, they, they are forced to, to make the trade-offs. Um, they are best placed to make the trade-offs. Um, but as, as Bjorn says, when that power balance shifts, that often comes back to bite a, a ministry of finance. I, I remember that um, when there was a change of administration in, in South Africa in 2009, there was a lot that was spoken about um, um, that sounded like there was going to be an attempt at clipping the wings of the Treasury, mm -hmm. not because it was performing badly, but because it was performing so well. Um, um, so, so just the, the, those two points. I think that it is about the people, and, and, and secondly, you know, there's also that danger that ministries of finance can be their own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think the lady um, was, was here. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, Maya King from <coughs> Queen Mary and formerly ODI. Thanks to the panel for the presentations. Um, I'd like to make a link back to some comments that were made in the earlier sessions. Uh, I think Marco mentioned the capacity to design reform. And also, um, Madam Jogo talked a lot about the need for it to be internally driven and externally supported. And so I'd just like to suggest another category for um, capability, which is the ability of uh, finance ministries to challenge the advice that's given by donors uh, and to therefore better tailor the reforms to the local context through that process of challenge and exchange. And I think that links a lot to this um, ability to learn and experiment in different ways. And I think we have one more here. And then we'll, we'll do another round. I okay. had a quick question for mm -hmm. Kenneth, but Richard and Bjorn may also have a view on this. It's regarding the merging of the two ministries into a single ministry. And I was curious, prior to that, was the reason for dual ministries for power sharing reasons? Was it politically mm -hmm. uh, power sharing uh, driven situation? And if it was, I'm curious about the conditions that allowed the merging to occur, what exactly allowed or facilitated what used to be a, a, a problem in requiring two entities into a single entity now. And in that regard, the efficacy now when it comes to PFM reform of having a single <coughs> ministry versus multiple ministries when it comes to PFM reform. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. Kenneth, would you like to start with that one? Yeah. yeah please. Now, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I think the merging of the ministries uh, was a result of the challenges uh, which emerged at, at the time. Uh, when the, of course, who is still the current president anyway, came to power in 1986, uh, his thinking was totally different. Uh, and he immediately started on implementing what he thought was the right program. But shortly after that, uh, he ran into a lot of challenges. So as a result, uh, uh, with support from uh, a number of you know, technical people and uh, these international financial institutions, it became apparent that he had to change you know, the course uh, of implementation. And that's what actually led also to the merging of the ministries and then actually placing the former, the permanent secretary who was in charge of the ministry of planning to become the permanent secretary in charge of the merged ministry. And that actually became the main <coughs> driver of the whole reform uh, uh, program. So as it is now, uh, we, of course, we have had a one ministry, and even the point actually that Neil talked about, the one of clipping, you know, wings, uh, that is always a challenge actually because there's also that thinking that uh, you have a minister of finance which is a super ministry, you know, people are mm -hmm. untouchable, mm -hmm. you, they have, you know, a lot of powers, uh, they make all the decisions about, you know, the way the resources are allocated, the way the resources are used. So there's always that pressure, uh, largely from the, you know, politicians to try and actually reduce the powers mm -hmm. uh, of the Minister of, the, our merged Minister of Finance and Planning. But again, as I said uh, in my presentation, I think the whole issue of having, you know, that kind of political, you know, uh, buy-in, you know, at the highest level uh, in the country has definitely helped a lot because the President really believes that he needs a strong Minister of Finance to be able to drive all these mm -hmm. processes. Uh, and, and I think he's happy that uh, at least there's some, you know, he, he can see some positive results uh, as a result of, you know, the work that the Minister of Finance uh, does in spite of 
all those you know kind of pressures uh, emerging from different circles now in terms of the pfm uh, uh, process again the minister of finance takes uh, the lead uh, we recently had a few challenges but again because of uh, the way uh, you know the, 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 the because of the nature of the minister of finance we have been able to quickly you know get all these challenges and actually undertake even additional reforms uh, as i speak we have implemented uh, a tsa the treasury single account uh, uh, starting actually from this quarter uh, the, the quarter which began uh, uh, in in september so so we are they still you know we, we are still able you know to look at the challenges that we are facing and be able actually to implement you know additional second kind of generation reforms uh, in terms of uh, pfm could I ask one quick follow-up, because we've received a, a message um, online okay. um, from JC Lapola, uh, from uh, the Deputy Head of Staff of the Vice Prim Prime Minister's Office, Minister of Budget in the DRC. And he had a quick follow-up to your, the questions regarding the merger um, of the Ministry of Finance and Planning. But specifically now, what about this new, what about the National Planning Bureau then? Where does that where does that now leave you in in the sense of you you were talking a little bit there about the um, questions of coordination and the relative roles? Can you say a little yeah, bit more about I, I, that? I think that's a good question. Now again, one has to look at uh, the political dynamics uh, that brought into uh, uh, that actually brought the National Planning Authority. Again, it was part of that whole move of trying to minimize. Th there is always tension. Okay, so you have you know some people who believe. Uh, that you need more of planning and then of course you have some people who believe that you need you know to largely <laughs> liberalize but at the same time you have you know some group uh, which wants to reduce the powers of the ministry of finance and that's actually how the ministry the national planning authority uh, came into being mm. it came actually as a result of the constitution <coughs> reform uh, of 1995 so as part of the constitution making process uh, there was that huge demand you know for kind of a centralized planning uh, system so the national planning authority was put in place but it actually took the national planning authority almost uh almost uh, 15 years to come into effect mm -hmm. after it had actually been put in the constitution and i think that also puts into perspective the, the, the dynamics i mean the whole discussion that was going on whether you need to move towards that kind of centralized planning or have a more market oriented and liberalized mm -hmm. but as it is now uh, they, are, they, they do take uh, the lead at least over time, there has been some kind of clear uh, division of responsibility uh, where the National Planning Authority undertakes the medium term plan and also the long term plan. And then the Minister of Finance concentrates uh, on the annual budget, uh, trying to link the annual budget to the medium term and also the long term plan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Richard, can, can we, can we um, ask you if you can respond to Imran's question about the, diff you know, the difference of Uganda and Liberia? Um, in terms of their capabilities, but the very similar reform path that they have been taking. What, any reflections on that? And any other the questions? Um, well, let me let me raise deal with a couple of other questions yes. first. And come back to that one. Um, first of all, um, on the issue of dynamic capability, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I fully understand this term in technic technical terms, but um, I was thinking of the United Kingdom here about the the way the Treasury, uh, the Ministry of Finance, has responded to, over the last 30 years, to particular developments, uh, economic developments. And for example, a good example is the global financial crisis, where there was huge pressures on the Treasury to build up its capacity uh, in understanding and dealing with the failing banks and the, the, the nationalization of banks, the big banks in the UK. Uh, and this was done by recruiting uh, building up the, the number of staff working in this area from about 20 to about 120, I think, in the space of six months, and also recruiting people from the City of London to provide technical support uh, to the, this process. So the, the Treasury has pr proved to be very adept at responding to economic crises by t in terms of moving its staff around. Uh, and moving its best staff into 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 areas where of, of key priority, it's also been accused of expanding too much uh, into 
areas that have got nothing to do or very little to do with managing public finances. Uh, and I mean, criti critics have said that this was responsible for some of the mistakes that the Treasury made uh, in not predicting the impact of the financial crisis on the UK that has expanded too much into areas such as social policy, industrial policy, labor market policies. It's become too much of a general ministry of economy mm -hmm. and finance and has forgotten its roots in, in, in managing the public finances. So um, this, is a, this is a country where the Treasury has enormous power and almost unmitigated, unlimited power to move into uh, areas of, e of economic and financial policy. So uh, in other countries, uh, it's interesting how finance ministers have had their wings clipped. I mean, the most recent example was in Ireland, where the Ministry of Finance was split, I think, into two uh, following an election. And, and, uh, and similarly, a similar thing occurred in Australia many years ago when the, the Treasury was getting too powerful and it was split into a Ministry of Finance and a Treasury. So in some countries, uh, when Ministries of Finance have become too powerful, they've mm. been divided into two pieces. So uh, this can happen. This is an example of clipping the wings of the, the Ministries of Finance. Um, one other point uh, that struck me, I mean, in, in, in developing countries, it seems to me that the capability issue is not just one of technical capability, learning, teaching people, or staff learning to become better at macroeconomic forecasting or better at analyzing budgetary information. It is also linked to their ability to as assert effective challenge role in relation <laughs> to line ministries. And th this was a big feature of the Heckler and Vildasky book where they discussed the way in which the Treasury interacted with the line ministries and got good value for money uh, from its, its, its dialogue with line ministries. This, generally speaking, doesn't happen very well in, in developing countries. I mean, in African countries, there's a big problem, I think, about ministries of finance building up this capacity to challenge the uh, budget proposals put forward by line ministries and have a real dialogue with them, not just about the technicalities of the budget, but about the uh, real issues and policies which underline those budgets. And that must reflect to some extent the relative strength <laughs> of the Ministry of Finance in relation to the, the line ministries. So I think that's another important aspect of capability which is hard to measure. <laughs> because it's about the, the relationship between, the real relationship between the, the ministry, for the budget officials and the, and, the, and, the line, and the line ministries. Sorry, I think, and so, perhaps, um, perhaps I can ask one of the other speakers to respond to Imran's question. In well, I think I would be very poorly qualified to <laughs> compare no. Uganda to Liberia in any meaningful <laughs> Oh, well, that's an interesting. <laughs> so would I, because I don't know like Uganda very well. <coughs> I'd like to pick up some of the other yes. points that were raised. If well, you would I mean, I, I, I feel a little bit reminded of the, the, the decorum that is exercised in the U.S. Senate, where where colleagues say that my my esteemed friend from the state of such and such, <laughs> before they then proceed to comprehensively skewer everything that they <laughs> said before. So, in that in that spirit of decorum and and, and comity of, of of this of this institution, I would like to respond to my esteemed friend from the <laughs> from the Australia National University. <laughs> Um, no, but seriously, I think these these were some these were some very interesting points. I'm not quite sure that I feel all that terribly challenged by them because I happen to agree with with the gist of the points that you were making, Bjorn. And I think it's it's worth taking them very seriously. And I think I absolutely just to start from the beginning, I absolutely agree that there is an ontological challenge here and there is an epistemological challenge here and it's 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 one of the things that we are grappling with that when we when I say colloquially Ministry of Finance 
we don't really agree what it is that I'm, what the nature of the entity is that we are talking about here. And, and someone, a literalist might say, when I say the Ministry of Finance, I'm referring to a particular building mm -hmm. with, with certain sets of inf infrastructure in it. Someone else, like Trevor Manuel, might say the Ministry of Finance is the sum of all the people that work in it. A German such as myself might, from a very legalist culture, might say that the Ministry of Finance is the sum of all the laws and regulations that assign authority to it. <coughs> and it's sort of unproblematic to wonder about anything else. And, and there might be, someone else yet again might say, there is no such thing as a Ministry of Finance in the first place. There are only central finance functions. Hmm. And we can never know the nature of these institutions, nor ought should it be necessary to particularly care about them, let's just look about how that function is, is performing by looking at the outcomes that we, that we think such a function should produce, such as the budget balance, such mm. as macroeconomic stability, or whatever other thing a central finance function performs. And if those numbers are agreeable with us, then by default, whatever happened sort of in front of it, in the in the production chain, how the sausage gets made, nobody really cares, and we can we can sort of leave that to the people who are in it. And I I don't particularly feel that it's necessary at this stage to say one of these posi positions is wrong. I mean, if if they are different, if they are different researchers with different methodological tra from different methodological traditions, different sort of. Um, disciplinary approaches, why not let a thousand flowers bloom and then let the marketplace decide if, if, if people produce different pieces of research and it gets picked up by people who want to use that stuff in order to actually um, get things done better. Um, I, d I don't see how I would particularly fuss about um, there not being an emerging consensus. And in fact, I, I think it would actually be brilliant if there would be different different pieces of, of research that take very, very different kinds of approaches and then come up with different different <coughs> kinds of conclusions. And sure, one of the conses consequences of that might be that, you know, a year from now we might be talking about seventeen different kinds of capabilities that ultimately just describe the same three capabilities. And it's just a very fluffy way of saying not very much. But surely you would have to go through that exercise in order to come up with something useful in the end. And um, I, I just want to come back to this question of, of numbers and measuring things as opposed to looking at, at discourse and the wider environment. I think, again, I'm, I'm not really too worried about the threat of measuring and counting stuff in the first place. I don't think that's a particularly problematic thing, whether it's economists who are doing it or maybe more con context sensitive kinds of uh, academics who use those numbers to to just see what what's out there i think what's problematic is being simplistic about ascribing a certain meaning to these numbers and then basically stopping to think so if you're saying um, so if you're saying let's count the number of staff working in a ministry and let's say that number is lower than it used to be. Does that mean that the ministry has become smaller, therefore less capable? Or does it mean that it's become smaller and therefore more nimble? No one really knows. But it's still more useful to know what the numbers are than not having any idea what the numbers are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think there's a lot of useful work that might be done just trying to understand what the basic parameters mm -hmm. of the conversation are before you have the actual conversation about what, what it all means in the scheme of things. And I think it's, it's, it's actually very exciting that you would be able to come at this from, um, from such different points of view. Just a final point, maybe, if I can just <laughs> twist the knife a little bit more. This, this issue about developmental states and the wider political economy environment, I think there's, there's a, if, if, if what, what is worrying you about the economists sort of tendency to construct indices and come up with, with fancy numbers that ultimately maybe are not particularly meaningful. I think one of the, one of the dangers of always, always looking at the entirety of the universe that exists around a very small thing that you actually find interesting is that, again, that you're just describing it. I almost recoil at myself saying this as a public administrationist because I actually like a lot of that stuff very much. But I don't think that 
every question about organizational capability needs to be sort of answered and, and, and framed by a grand statement about, and by the way, this is a, uh, this is a clientist state, this is, a, um, this is, this is an, a state where elites are skimming off rents. I'm not entirely sure, just empirically speaking, that knowing whether there is rent, um, rent seeking taking place or knowing that this is a state where the head of the government is actually putting aside money through various sort of <coughs> illicit or illicit means, does that mean that the Ministry of Finance has to be less capable? Are we sort of convinced that everything that is happening in those tiny little spaces is conditioned by the grand macro environment? I'm obviously, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you're saying everything is conditioned by it. I, I wouldn't say nothing is conditioned by it. I think it's useful to be aware of these things. That doesn't mean that you always need to have a chapter about all the things that are happening in the outside wider world in order to be able to say something meaningful about what's happening inside those little offices that we just happen to be interested in just now. I'm going to leave okay, it at that. Well, so the, the good news is, of course, that uh, Germans stab each other, but they always have a beer at the end of the day. So, <laughs> uh, you know, in that spirit, of course, you know, uh, this was meant to engage in a discussion. Um, and I'm not actually going to speak long because I want to have another round yes. of questions. But let me just uh, say one thing. When you have a certain notion in mind of what you're looking for, you only see the things you want to see. And I think my point was there's more to see and we should train ourselves to see these things. And the same notion I want to play back here is that I think we have to understand that in different settings that are might, might be different structurally, the functions <coughs> of ministries of finance might be very different. And I just want to uh, highlight this by going to the question here about uh, concentration. Yesterday, uh, Richard and I had an interesting dinner conversation in which Richard, coming back from an IMF mission to Malaysia, said, well, Bjorn, this was really dazzling. How come that the prime minister of Malaysia is also the finance minister? This is really boring, you know, from a, from a perspective. And, uh, and again, I would say, in a context like Malaysia, where the social contract is an ethnic contract, where rent ag aggregation and distribution is central to maintaining this kind of contract, it's a logical choice. So I'm actually not particularly worried about it. Uh, I noticed it, and I'm not saying that then we have to accept that the Ministry of Finance is a low capability Ministry of Finance, but we have to start from a different assumption, first of all, of what it can mm -hmm. achieve in these kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's all what mm -hmm. I'm saying, and I think this debate mm -hmm. should be carried on over uh, beer. <laughs> but in the meantime, <laughs> maybe if we... <laughs> no, do yeah. Let's do, it. Let's do a, a, a one quick more further round. I think Ian's been waiting very patiently there. And then one, two, three, four, yeah. And I'm sorry if I'm missing people this side. Andy, okay. Yes. Just a few. <laughs> I, um, Quick ones, please. <coughs> my great-grandfather came from Germany, and I'm sure that he would appreciate a beer afterwards <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, my honorable colleague, Richard, <laughs> and my honorable colleague, Kenneth, I would like to be a little provocative by at this stage by, by saying that the, uh, you both concluded that there was no blueprint for a capable Ministry of Finance, or, or measuring the, the capabilities. I think I'll, I'll say exactly the opposite, but then qualify it by saying that you could measure using Richard's framework, which he presented in about his last slide, for the budget department. I would say for a generic function of a Ministry of Finance, or a collection of generic functions, that is to say, a macro fiscal department, a budget department, a tax policy department, a budget execution oversight department, or if it's doing the transactions, the, the, the transactional aspect, the government accounting department, the oversight of internal audit. Uh, you could break down the Ministry of Finance into some generic departments, and you could do the type of analysis which, which uh, Richard put up. What are the objectives? Mm -hmm. There's the policy advice function, which for the high level departments such as the macro fiscal department, it's much more, and budget department, tax policy department, they're much more with the, with the, whole, in with the whole process of what is the output of a ministry of finance. And then there's the operation. So you could conceivably, and uh, Born, you can get your PhD students or master's students to, to do it to, to, to look at this for 
or IMF or World Prem, uh, Nicola, you could do it at the World Bank. Look at these generic functions and for a set of ministries of finances in, in, in a wide variety. What are the outputs? What are the inputs? Because Richard put up mm -hmm. some numbers for, for France, uh, 145,000 people who are keeping accounts and 35,000 communes and compared it with the with UK, 1,230 in, in HM Treasury, I think he put up but it doesn't count uh, uh, local authorities. But, you know, looking at inputs, outputs, and processes in those, and then coming up with the outputs <coughs> of a Ministry of Finance. But then you're only halfway there, because you want to get to the ultimate objective. You want to get to the outcomes of a good pub bu budget and public financial management system. Then you bring in what is external to the Ministry of Finance proper, and I'm thinking of, of a Ministry of Finance staffed by civil servants, non-political, then you bring in the political analysis which you, which you were referring to. These are external to the Ministry of Civil Servants who are doing these functions, but you've got a Minister of Finance, you could analyze, analyze that relationship closely, the Cabinet of Ministers, and the relationship that implies relationships with all of the other uh, ministries. Uh, and then the parliament as, as, as the other major political body and the state audit institution, these would be to try to look at, bring in the, those other factors. Uh, there would be a two-part approach. So there is a methodology <laughs> which is being proposed later okay. at the stage. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to comment on it, you may. <laughs> uh, thanks. Anand, I think, is next. Uh, thanks for that very, very interesting discussion between uh, Bjorn and, uh, and Philip. Uh, a very good response and a very good set of questions. But I want to sort of put the question in a form where I think the approach of saying let, the, let a thousand flowers bloom and let somebody take care of the political economy analysis might be a problematic approach. So if we go back to the question that was posed this morning by Antoinette and then also raised a number of times later about natural resources coming in in very large amounts to these countries, it is certainly going to change the nature of the game, the nature of the politics in these countries. That will have an effect on how uh, pressures will be brought to bear to make ministries of finance be less effective in channeling resources for inclusive mm -hmm. development, sustainable development. So I think if we sort of think about the, if we think about political economy as an add-on and not think about it as an organic part of this thinking process, we probably will be at risk of again making technical recommendations and hoping for political will to emerge. And political will can emerge in the form of individual champions. But I think we have to approach this problem much more organically. And that's why I think the methodological approach is something we need to take a lot more seriously. And it does come at this point in this, for most of us as, as a hard adjustment. But the more we acknowledge it, the more we should take that on board. Please. And then Simon. Uh, I, I'm Alistair McKechnie, o o ODI. And I'd like to thank Bjorn for lifting the veil on Philip's elephant even if we're still debating whether it's skewered or not. But um, the, point I, the, the, point I, the question I'd like to, to, um, to ask is, is to what extent is the ability to manage rents um, in the collective interests of the country an attribute of a successful finance ministry? Because we haven't talked much about how investment and procurement decisions are taken in a country or about how a finance ministry connects with informal, uh, informal networks in a country, and also the degree to which transactions are personalized. And, and if you want to get paid or a dis procurement decision made, to what extent um, does an individual have to go to the, to the ministry? And, and, and also, what is the nature of the interaction between the finance <coughs> ministry and the private sector? I mean, this could be um, providing information to make sounder public policies in the collective good, or it could also be rent-seeking. So the, 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 the really the question is about the ability of a finance ministry to manage rents, which East Asian countries may have done successfully, but countries in other parts of the world it may have set back their development. Thank you. Um, uh, Simon, I think. It's just a quick comment um, about context and capability. I'm just thinking, reflecting on two experiences. 
in Lesotho in the early 1990s, huge fiscal deficits, real primacy on the Ministry of Finance controlling and reducing the deficit. And that was the expectation, and that was what was required at that stage. Slightly rolling the clock on about 20 years, experience in Tanzania, biggest budget support recipient in Africa, an expectation that the Ministry of Finance would co coordinate the whole of government to donors, and a lot of disappointment from donors when it maybe didn't live up to that expectation. So I think the, sometimes the role we expect of Ministries of Finance changes over time, and sometimes our expectations thereof are unrealistic. And I think we've got two more, um, one more here, and then Andy, who's, who's still right here. Um, Chola Chabala once again from Zambia. I know there's no one size fits all, and uh, there's, uh, everything has to be put in context. But I would like to ask a question, and uh, I don't have an answer. What's the general consensus with regards to <coughs> the configuration of the ministers of finance, either merging it with the planning or having Minister of Finance on one side and the planning uh, function on the other side. In Zambia, we've done it both. Of it. Uh, we've gone through the part of having separate ministries, and <coughs> now we are merged. But I just want to know around the world, where is the general consensus tilting to? And one last one, I think. Um, I'm going to hijack my mic just before I hand it over. Uh, Bruno Adam, Research Fellow. I'd like to ask the panel just quickly whether you are working with the assumption that ministries of finance generally are more capable than the line ministries that they are trying to work with or whether you are neutral on that subject and it's not s such a big issue. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I also had a sort of general consensus question. Uh, I'd quite like to hear what the panel have to say about the balance of... Uh, a political leadership of a Ministry of Finance and a technical leadership. So, for example, in the Francophone model or the US model or the Liberia model, uh, political appointees are very much managing the Ministry of Finance, whereas in the Anglophone model, such as in Uganda, uh, you'd have a permanent Secretary of Treasury mm -hmm. who would essentially run the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and uh, uh, thinking back to Uganda, I, I, I often forget the names of the Ministers of Finance, but I remember <laughs> all of the permanent secretaries. <laughs> You know, which shows who, who really calls the shots. Um, and I'm, I, my question is just whether there is a view about uh, the primacy of one model uh, against the other. And I'm going to let the gentleman, one last quick one, if we can pass the microphone, and then we will, that really will be <laughs> And I'm perhaps the only person in the room and who lived through Harold Wilson uh, seeing the dead hand of the Treasury and therefore establishing a separate Ministry of Economic Affairs. And the experience of the UK at that time was uh, that actually the people who uh, hold the purse strings uh, win in the end. And the Department of Economic Affairs uh, effectively failed quite quickly. Uh, looking around on the basis of um, doing PFA in various places in more recent years, um, having a separate planning ministry uh, seems to be very often a, a relic of um, the former Soviet system, uh, that you have to have planning of that kind. Um, and my prejudice remains uh, from my old UK experience uh, that it's much better uh, to accept that the Ministry of Finance is in charge of things, uh, but you need to pay attention to the, uh, the medium term and the outcomes from uh, different <coughs> expenditure programs and not just to the uh, annual exercise and and bits of arithmetic, and um, forgive me for that. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you very much. I'm, I'm <coughs> we have one, have I been, sorry, I've been ignoring this side a little too much. Is there someone been asking a question this side? Did we, I we oh no? Okay, um, well, so a huge range of contributions, I think, to, to, to indicating that this is a sort of a very lively, but still quite early in its, uh, Formation around this sort of issue. Uh, they've been a long time. Um, I'm going to ask. I'm going to give a very short opportunity for each of the panelists to say, uh, to pick on anything you'd like to respond to. But I'd also like to just, if you can, just say something about where do we go from here? Because I think um, uh, this is a lovely conversation. And but what if you were to say one thing of the of a next step? I'm not going to ask you to be able to sort of 
come to a conclusion necessarily, but if, if we're going to say as a collective, or um, what is then one uh, a next step that we need to be working on to advance this? Maybe <coughs> carrying on with the research we're already doing, but how do we how do we move on re from re from both in the research sense and in an operational sense? So who would like to go first? <laughs> <Silly>. <laughs> I can go. I can go first. Um, I think just just to start off, Anand. I think I actually agree with you to s so much that I would propose to almost retire the term political economy altogether, because in, to my mind it would be useful to integrate it in pretty much anything that we would now call technical analysis of whatever the thing is that you are technically analyzing. I think to my mind there's. There's no particularly meaningful distinction between looking at the, the large-scale politics where then it's okay to look at incentives and, and, and flows of money and how that shapes what it is that people want. And as soon as you are entering the small offices of the budget department, then all of a sudden it's not okay anymore to think about incentives and institutions and all those things that you probably mean when you say political economy. So I, I would say very, very emphatically, <laughs> Yes, and I think it would be it would be a horrible state of affairs, which is probably also an accurate description of the current state of affairs, to have a separate thing that you call the political economy analysis that nobody reads because it's kind of fussy, mm -hmm. and 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 then you have all the technical stuff which is not politically savvy, bureaucratically savvy, and institutionally savvy, and I think to my mind that would be the way to go, which if I can sort of double down, um, that to me would also be a very practical step going forward as we, as we think more about ministries of finance, but also um, in other areas of PFM. If we could integrate that stuff a little bit more, instead of trying to come up with a new series of products, <laughs> analytical products or whatever that would be called the political economy of, I think that would be, that would actually be quite neat. Um, on, uh, sort of more tangible next steps, I, I really do think that having a little bit more variety of material and product out there is, is, is probably in the more very, very general sense what, what I would hope to see in the near future in this field. I think I'd, I always come back to this thing that you have Heckler Wildowski doing their piece in 1972 or whenever it was, and <coughs> everyone cites this as the, this fantastic analysis, very good sociology of what is happening in the treasury of one country, and then after that, nothing at all. It hasn't really spawned a, a literature on, on these things, it hasn't really spawned a methodological debate on these things, and I think it's a great shame. It would be nice if two years from now at APSA or at the, the American Association of Public Administration <coughs> or all these different, different conferences, you would just be able to have a series of panels that would look at different sub-questions of what ministries of finance do, and that would just be considered a totally normal thing. Full stop. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Richard, did you? Yeah, just a couple, of, a couple of points. I think there's an interesting question about the role of political advisors in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in ministries of finance and government. I mean, it seems to me, my experience is that, that uh, the number of advisors should be limited uh, and it's very useful to have a head of the Ministry of Finance who is responsible for the organization, for the management of the organization, the, the kind of permanent secretary role which, which you find in many Anglophone countries and a lot in Africa too. It's interesting that in France it's moved a little bit in that direction uh, traditionally, it's been, you know, the political advice has come through the cabinet. The cabinet has been the, the link between the civil service and the and the minister. But but recently, I think in France, they've appointed a, uh, a kind of permanent secretary equivalent who's responsible for the administration mm -hmm. uh, of the Ministry of Finance. So, so that is a move in the direction of the of the, of the Westminster, the Anglo model, if you like. Uh, on the planning ministries and ministries of finance, this is a, a very, very difficult issue. I've, I've, I, I really can't point to any country where this has been satisfactorily resolved. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, uh, one, one possibility is uh, to, I think, is in, you did in Uganda. I may, may be correct there. 
uh, that the functions of the planning officers and the budget officers has been combined. So the so one cadre of civil servants is responsible for preparing the medium term plan and also the budget. Uh, and the other uh, possibility, which I think is promising, is to is to separate out long term planning issues. Uh, you know, Millennium Development Goal issues, very long term issues. Uh, which could be done by some planning commission or maybe in the president's office or something, and issue and planning issues related to the medium term, which is closely linked to the development of the public investment plan and, and eventually to the development of a medium term expenditure framework, which should seem to me to be done in the Ministry of Finance, and that, that seems to me a, a development worth thinking about. Uh, and in Kenya, I think something like that is, is under consideration. On the way forward, um, I think we have to continue with the work we're already doing. I mean, uh, within the fund, uh, a lot of technical assistance is being done in countries. We're learning from that. We're learning what is useful uh, for finance ministers to know what the issues are that they want to have considered, and I think that work will go forward. We're doing some work on the methodology that Ian talked about, and I think that we can refine that and develop that and try and make it a, a workable tool, which will be useful. I, th I think it has its limitations or some issues it cannot look at, but I think it has some, some relevance. And, and, and that link to that is the work that, uh, that Philip is doing here, uh, which I think is very important. So I, I think on a number of fronts the work can go forward through technical assistance, development of methodologies on capability, more academic type research and case studies of different countries, all, all that could be very useful. So I, th I think this is a relatively new field, and I think I think there's a lot to be done still. Okay, great. Um, can, I yes, can I please? Yeah. yeah, I wanted to make maybe one or two points uh, mm -hmm. on this question of uh, uh, natural resources. I think this is an issue which uh, uh, needs to be critically looked at. Uh, I believe because you are looking at countries uh, which we are, for example, like donor dependent, but now all of a sudden they have this boom. <coughs> So the whole, the, the dynamics will definitely change in terms of managing the budget. Uh, in many of our countries, uh, especially, as I said, donor-dependent countries, uh, you have donors playing some kind of, you know, role. Mm -hmm. Okay, of course, a big brother kind of, you know, <laughs> function. Now, where you have these mm -hmm. uh, resources arising out of the natural resource boom, you certainly do not have that. Of course, it is also, it has its own challenges as well. But you have that kind of challenge now of managing, you know, all these resources. In Uganda, we are seeing it, you know, uh, uh, coming. Uh, of course, as probably people know, we have uh, we are one of the countries which uh, discovered oil uh, recently, and we have started generating some resources, you know, from oil, largely in terms of the capital gains tax. And there was a huge, you know, debate on how to use these resources. Of course, not much yet, uh, about half a billion US, US dollars. But it was a very big debate on how this money, you know, should be used. Of course, as it is now, uh, the Minister of Finance is still, you know, uh, in control, is still resisting uh, with the support of the President because this money has actually been saved. Mm -hmm. But the question is, for how much longer can you actually, you know, resist, you know, those pressures, especially when the resources, you know, uh, increase. But also in terms of the competencies that are required, I believe the competencies will also, there will be, there'll be some kind of different kind of capabilities uh, that will be required to manage you know, all these resources as, as they mm -hmm. uh, start flowing in. Now, this issue of uh, Minister of Finance uh, and other ministries in terms of capabilities, I, I believe in terms of in developing countries, it definitely does help uh, where you have a Minister of Finance that has more capabilities, mm -hmm. you know, than these other ministries. Uh, the challenge function that he, uh, uh, Richard talked about, of course, you need a Minister of Finance that is able, you know, to undertake that kind of challenge function uh, in all aspects of, uh, you know, uh, 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 project and, you know, budget uh, preparation and implementation. So if you don't have that, then actually you have, you know, a, a big problem where you don't have a Minister of Finance that can actually undertake uh, that kind of function. That's one of the areas uh, in the case of Uganda that we are trying to uh, strengthen uh, to ensure that our staff, you know, have the capacity, you know, to question a lot of these issues, you know, the, either the projects which the ministries uh, are generating 
or even the way they are allocating resources and even how they are actually using mm -hmm. you know those resources i think that's uh, something which is uh, very very uh, critical mm -hmm. now the balance between uh, uh, political and technical co competencies in the case of uganda as i said of course uh, it is the technical uh, staff that have spearheaded uh, the reforms and the we have seen that, as I said, helping sustain uh, the whole reform program uh, in the sense that, you know, they have been able to groom, you know, young people who have actually come up and because they have grown up in that same system and they actually have kind of the incentive, you know, the, the, the whole incentive structure that was talked about in the morning, not just in terms of pay, but uh, even in terms of responsibility, because I think there is actually a whole question of having an incentive based on the responsibilities which have been the fact that you have been able you have been given th those responsibilities so in the case of uganda i believe it has actually worked well now in other countries i don't know but in our setup uh, i believe it works you know to have the technical competence the, 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 the capabilities you know vested in the technical staff uh, uh, so however much the politicians change uh, you are able to sustain you know uh, the, the reform program thank you okay. Kind of, is, there, is there one, I mean, you, I think you've alluded to um, strengthening the challenge function in a sense, or the challenge capability yeah. as, as a, a major thing for you as a next step in the Ugandan yeah, context? Yeah. In the Ugandan context. Yeah. Natural resources in and then the challenge the function, yes. Okay, okay so, um, uh, so here's the secret. If you ever want an academic to shut up, ask him a practical, <laughs> uh, a practical <laughs> suggestion and question. So that's what just happened. Um, <laughs> and uh, indeed, you know, natural resources is a really difficult uh, it's precisely in the paper that I just mentioned, why has Southeast Asia developed so differently from East Asia? And, and the resource abundance or scarcity, I think, is a critical factor. As a matter of fact, if I may just add, <coughs> even in Australia right now, we see a deterioration in institutional capacity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just because you developed, you're not immune to it. How do you manage the resources? Quite frankly, I think the key is the type of coalitions, our attention needs to go to the type of actors and coalitions. And this is how I would see the way forward. Here's my wish list. I buy into your organic notion of political economy, but I would wish that the World Bank is not, and people like you and others, are not starting to sell always the political economy agenda as a risk mitigation agenda. That's the way how you have tried to get <coughs> the, the, you know, the buy-in from a lot of constituencies. But what you have done in the process is essentially to compromise that agenda. And I think you know, mm -hmm. taking political economy serious means to do often less than more. It takes uh, a different role for you as World Bank staff, moving not to drivers but to facilitators, and a host of other things <coughs> that being more deeply embedded. The other thing I would say, and I would wish is uh, moving forward, is that we have to move gradually, and this is just because it has been so emphasized that I'm also de-emphasizing it, gradually again to the actor perspective vis-a-vis -vis the institutional perspective. I think we have had a lot of growth and I think we have made great strides, but I think maybe the pendulum is time that it swings back to a different type of perspective and I hope that I've laid out some of the issues that, that might be helpful in that process. Okay.